Now, this is how bad it was. You borrowed five quid, you had to pay back seven, 40% interest. And if you missed a payment, up to 50. Now this was the only way you could get a loan. I'm not exaggerating. Hi, my name's Mick Dolman. I'm the chair of Unity Bank. In 1970, I went away to sea in the Port of Melbourne. That same year, the Waterside Workers Federation changed the lives of thousands of members by establishing their credit union, which affectionately became known as the Credo. Today, you're gonna to hear how that has led to the establishment of Unity Bank, your bank. I started on the waterfront when I was 21 years of age. The conditions down there at that time were abominable. In the gang, you rotated job by job. So you could be on deck for a whole ship. Next ship, you could have been down below, working down below. Or, and then the job after that you got, you rotated, you could be out in the gangway. Uh, I'd been in the waterfront, I did 32 years, yeah. Working as a casual, you would be called to the centre most days. Uh, it was a centre where they issued out jobs and you'd wait. And if your number was called out, well, you got a job. If it wasn't, we didn't get a job. I'm covered in skin cancers because when you ask for some cover to keep the sun off you, you usually got the sack. Things weren't really that flash. Doing the wharves in 1962, and my first job was a wool job. And here I am, pulling up the three and four hundred pound bales of wool and stowing them too high and three high. It was a shock to the system, my first job. It was uh, hard times down there, and people had to find a way of saving money and paying their bills. Before permanency, people weren't sure how much money they get from week to week. The majority of wharfies still lived in the inner city, not owning their own homes, paying rent. And so we couldn't save up enough to put a deposit on a house, and in those days, if my memory serves me correct, was 25%. And then you couldn't borrow. And a lot of waterside workers didn't even have a bank account. If you got a big week, you wouldn't put it in, into the bank anyway when you had a bank account because next week you might only get two days. And there were no auto tellers in those days, of course. So you, you would just put it in, in a drawer in your, in your bedroom. And of course, it became a bit tempting. If you got two full weeks, you'd say, oh, well, I'll pull it all out, we'll have a night out. The next time your water bill came in, you wouldn't quite have enough cash to pay for it. Locked out of the banks and other financial institutions, the Wharfers became aware of an alternative growing international cooperative force. We heard about these credit unions in the US. In Australia too, credit unions were beginning to emerge. In 1968, Labor Party leader Gough Whitlam predicted that the credit unions will play an increasing role in the community as a force for good. And we had a uh, national secretary in Charlie Fitzgibbons who had the foresight because he knew that even though we were permanent, we were seen by banks, lending institutions as still casual. The federal office had got in touch with the the credit union group or society or whatever it was in the US, a man was sent out to tell us about it. He came out and explained how it worked and it sounded really good. And, and he said, it's, it's up to the members to run it. And it's a non-profit organisation so that, that you, you can loan money out at a lower rate and there's benefits for everybody, you know, because it, it's cheaper than a bank. There are no shareholders except the members. It's a, a better system altogether. Well, we thought it sounded like a good idea. So in March 1970, at the Wharfy Stop Work meeting in the Sydney Town Hall. Oh, my Jesus, hadn't this changed? 
General Secretary Charlie Fitzgibbons formally proposed the establishment of a credit union to the union's membership. There would have been, well, there would have been in excess of a thousand at that meeting. Oh, yeah, all warpies and tubby clerks. And it was just uh, packed to the doors. And it was an enormous uh, response to it. You were told if you wanted to join up that day, to go up to Caltex House at um, Clarence Street in Clarence uh, Millers Point yeah. and uh, sign up and that's what did, most of us done. So we all went up on the same day, some got there earlier than others, I got there earlier than Sid and Glenn got, got there earlier faster. than me. We might have called in for a beer on the way, I've yeah. got, a feel, <laughs> got a feeling. And Charlie also had the foresight and what he did, he got 40 people, 40 people to sign and become the registered owners of this of the company had to be a company. They all were waterside workers. There were a number of the people that worked in the union offices. From the members themselves, it was a, a great opportunity now that here we are, we're going to be treated as human beings. With the credit union now officially established, more than 3,500 waterside workers throughout Australia quickly joined up. The challenge now was to build resources and staff from a very modest beginning. We started off in a very small way as a, as a credit union. It was very simplified in those days. It was just deposits and then what we got in deposits and then we lent out to our members. Um, it was all passbooks, so it was all done manually. The credit union was a way of saving money rather than going to the pub and drinking it. And you knew that you could have a, a bit of a bank and what was told us after an amount of time, if you've been proven to be a, a proper saver, you could go and get a loan. Each branch had, had what they call loan offices. When we first started loaning out money, there was very little capital to loan. At the start, they are only for small loans, you know. Um, I was a loan officer for a time and I, I'd go there once a week and, and organise loans too. And it was, Normally for things like, um, well, I'm broke, my car needs new tyres, can you loan me enough money to get the new tyres? Or we would do consolidating loans, they were a very big thing. You'd say, all right, well, we'll consolidate the debt and instead of paying 13% interest, you will pay our interest rate, which was, was less, you know? And the best thing about it was, you can be sure you will get the money back because you, you don't dud your mates that you're working with tomorrow, you know? Everybody did the right thing because they were looking after themselves and their mates. I joined what they call the Port Sloan Committee, uh, which was a group of about four or five people here in Sydney. But we had to look at each loan application that was put in by the members and give it the yes or no. And uh, the beauty of of having the loans committee and having people, your own peers, determine whether you're going to get a loan or not, depended upon what you were going to do with that money. In my time, uh, I saw them grow up to, to motor cars. You'd have a, you could borrow money for a motor car, but that took, I'm not sure, three, three, maybe four years before that type of money was available. But people also, their accounts grew too. With the continued growth in funds, the credit union moved to a properly trained and professional staff to meet the membership's increasing requirements throughout Australia. From the 1970s through to the 1980s, the credit union emerged to be one of the most successful in the country, with branches established at workplaces throughout Australia. By the mid-1990s, it was positioned for a new era of growth. So, originally the credit union was started by the Wharfies in 1970. And over the years, it's gradually expanded its bond. You know, so after the wharfies, it obviously brought in the, the seafarers and really was a credit union dedicated to that industry for, for many a year. In 1999, I was one of the first three women at Patrick's at Port Botany. I became aware of the credit union it was at the time. You know, on my first day on the waterfront, because there was a, a branch on our, in our terminal at Patrick's at Port Botany, there was a, a little window down the hallway that had um, Chrissy in it where you could do all your banking. It was just like a normal bank branch on our work site. So I think I joined probably on my second day or third day in the wharf. I joined the, the credit union 
um, and I moved all of my accounts, everything over to the credit union and I never banked anywhere else ever since. At, at that point, the credit union only just had spoken about expanding its services into other industrial areas. It was really in only 2008 when the first merger happened and that was with the power credit union. And they grew out of the power stations, basically the people who worked at those power stations had their own credit union and they approached us about a merger. One of the important things of any financial institution, even back then, was to grow. Um, the cost of doing business was increasing significantly, more regulation, greater competition. So we needed to scale up the business, but we, we didn't want to do it in a way that took us away from our origins, our principles, our values and our connections to our industry partners. And I was lucky enough during the 17 years I had here to have two wonderful chairs. John Coombs was my chair for the first 10 years I was here. Great union leader, but also a great leader of a financial institution. Uh, someone had great foresight into the future, who was commercially savvy, uh, and who, who actually brought on a number of these mergers originally. So initially what the, the board at the time decided to do, which was a great decision, was to expand into the mining and energy division of the CFMEU. Mining and energy members are spread throughout the country. Uh, wherever the coal fields are, wherever the power stations are. So all of a sudden we got branches in, in Musselbrook, we got a branch out at Lithgow. So that gave us a, a good connection to those other communities that we're already serving through the, through the Union Association. We've had a very close relationship with the Maritime Union and the Miners Union has always, either the power workers or the mine workers, have always had an involvement in community credit unions. The ideals again and, and the principles are so aligned so when we had miners in the room and wharfies and seafarers in the room they just got on really well and that led to us getting a you know, directive from the mining division onto our board uh, and it just cemented that relationship and we grew substantially in basically every coal mining town on the east coast we actually had representation and offices in there. The board decided after the merger with power that it was important we looked at other opportunities uh, to scale the business up and the opportunity came up with Reliance Credit Union in Bathurst. Now the connection there for us was that we were looking at expanding into Mudgee because of the mining activity that was happening out there. We already had the branch in Lithgow, so we thought it would give us a great regional hub. So the decision was made in 2010 to merge with Reliance Credit Union. And that was our first taste of community banking. And it's been a wonderful success because that community is used to cooperatives being in a regional area. They understand what uh, a member-owned organisation stands for and they're used to working together uh, as a community. So us being able to plan our values and principles into that town uh, j just uh, took off and it's been a great success for us. So we have a good mix, like half the business is on the union side and then the, the other half being community. So it is a good mix of industry and community. We ended up having nine mergers and no other mutual credit union or mutual bank had more mergers than this organisation did. One of the great benefits of the mergers is it's given us the capacity to continue to do what was important for our members, to, to maintain what made us different from other financial institutions. And every merger gave us greater capacity to provide greater access because all of a sudden we got more branches. We had greater capacity to invest in technology so we can have a better banking app, we can have a better website and to maintain what was important to us was, was that relationship, that intimate relationship we had with our members. And we're in places like Galaganbone, Yagara and Trundle. Now these are small little towns in the central west and the reason we're there is the last bank pulled out and left them stranded. So what did the Credit Union Mutual Bank went into those communities, worked with the local Progress Association and set up a, a one-stop shop to provide banking services in those communities. And there's no one else in town except us. So that, you know, that was a really great demonstration of what a member-owned organisation can do to small communities where the larger organisations just leave them stranded. The real value of our credit union as a member-owned institution was further illustrated by the role in the 1998 Patrick's dispute throughout the Australian waterfront. At around about 12 o'clock at night, the security came in with dogs, people in balaclavas, pulling them out of the machines, telling them to get off the, off the property. They couldn't even go to their locker and get what, they, what was in their locker. In fact, they were all broken into by these goons over the ensuing period. And so here we were, faced with most probably the biggest dispute on the Australian waterfront in its history. In the Patrick dispute, 
when 2,000 workers were stripped illegally of all of their entitlements and were thrown out on the street virtually and uh, their mortgages and you know it was all in the balance and the credit union found the resources to carry those people with the understanding and the full support of the whole of the membership. The MUA had set up a fund for the stupidoring members that were locked out of Patrick's. Our main concern was looking after them in the time of needs, working very closely with the MUA. So my role was making sure that that money that was coming in was then distributed into the members' accounts that were going through the dispute. I was an official at the time of the Patrick's dispute. It just uh, devastated a lot of people. And if it hadn't been for the credit union, we would, wouldn't have been able to pay the people of Patrick's. If you had a loan with the credit union, all, all repayments stopped until that dispute was over. Um, there was no interest added to it. It's just your loan stopped, ceased, and then when you went back to work, you started paying again. We had, um, yes, members coming into the office, but it was more that we had staff going out to the picket lines. But when we went back to work, we went back for the first month with no wages. And again, during that period, the credit union didn't call on loans of any description, especially home loans. We have gone through, you know, numerous disputes. I think the main thing is being in contact with every member that has been locked out or going through a dispute and letting them know that we're there to help them through it. The Hutchison's dispute in 2015, when Hutchison sacked 110 Wharfies by text message at 11 o'clock at night, that turned into a 136 day dispute. We were outside the gate um, of that terminal. But you know who was there second after the union? Unity Bank. Mark Nestor was straight down to the wharves at, um, at Botany and the CEO was down there, Mark Genovese, the whole lot, the staff were down there bringing food to the picket line, bringing beanies and hats, bringing t-shirts, bringing gear, bringing support. Uh, same in Brisbane, the Unity Bank went straight down there. During lengthy periods of industrial action, which unfortunately happen sometimes, you can never get a retail bank to suspend your loans or to give you extra service. Uh, Unity Bank turns up. They turn up They've got their office in the boot of the car and they look after our people. It seems odd to tell that story to people because the, what your bank turned up to support you in an in industrial dispute, that's just absurd. But Unity Bank have always been there doing that stuff. Whenever there are pressing community needs, the bank is the first to step up with sponsorship, with extra services. It is always looking after the the person and their financial needs, but also being able to help support some of those smaller communities and charities. In times of, of industrial action, our people need um, more specific um, service from the bank and they get it and they appreciate it and it's not able to be replicated by anybody else. Part of the bank's strategy is really to be specialised around the communities and the industries that we want to serve. Uh, and part of that is really integrating ourselves into the fabric of those communities and in industries. So we built partnerships with all of those organisations and ended up sponsoring over 90 different events every year. We participate in things like the May Day marches. We participate in community events uh, out through Bathurst. We're the major sponsor of the, the Bathurst Royal Show, uh, which is a really great uh, community event out there. The, the quality of our staff is so vital to us and those relationships that our staff have with our members is fantastic. That's what gets me coming into work every day. I love working with, a, with my team. They're very loyal, hardworking, and it takes a certain person to be on the front line every day with members. The service is, is totally different to the big banks. If anyone's still with the big banks, they're crazy. It, you know, they should be with Unity Bank because of that service and the staff care and the staff know your name and they will ring you if they think you're in hard times. Now when we're talking to our members, we're not talking to our members about pushing a particular product or a service, we're talking to them about what they need, you know, giving them advice, uh, even just sim simply having a chat. Especially at the moment with COVID, we're calling all of our members over 60 
and just the joy that that has given, you know, some of our older members that someone's taking the time to call them to ask how they are. That's the difference between this bank and, and another bank. We're not all about you know, pushing products and generating revenue out of people. We're really here to make sure that our members are being looked after. To continue to meet the challenges of a growing organisation, the credit union needed to position itself for the future. We needed to engage with younger people and people of the younger generation just didn't resonate with the word credit union. And we did a lot of research and went out and talked to people both in the industrial side and the community side of our membership. And it became clear to the board and Mick that unless we change our name, we're going to find it very difficult to connect with the younger generation who ultimately will be our future. So when the credit union was thinking about rebranding into a mutual bank, one of the big considerations obviously was, what do you call it? So we kicked around a whole range of ideas and in fact it was one of our staff that came up with the name of Unity Bank. It's a name that resonated with the trade unions obviously. And when we started thinking about it, when the board started thinking about it, it actually represents the ideals of the founders all those years ago. The reason why I wanted all my banking to be with the credit union is because of the history of it. Because it was started by us, it was started by members that came before me on the waterfront, um, down on the docks in Sydney, when nobody would lend money to Wharfies, when they had no banks that would look after them. They started their own credit union, that's huge, that's a big deal, and it's ours. And when I look at the, where we started, first and foremost, no other credit union started with having 2,000 people in a room at once signing a petition to, to start a credit union. That did not happen anywhere else. The bank will have your back and proven that, and that it wasn't a bank of elites, you know, from the managers. People like Mark Genovese, you know, who's been a standout, now, now Danny, because they believe it. They're, they're not employees. They're, the wonderful staff, you know, the, many of them, you know, that started off uh, out of Wharfies families, kids of Wharfies or came from the industry or partners in, uh, in, in some cases, they believe in the credit union. Our union is incredibly indebted to the people with the foresight back in 1970 that set up this credit union that turned into a bank. People like Jimmy Donovan uh, have uh, done wonders uh, for the working class, for maritime workers and for mine workers and energy workers. Uh, it's a great legacy uh, and it has to be continued. It's a successful example of worker involvement in a financial institution. So when I started here, we had 13,000 members, 90 million in assets. When I left here 17 years later, 1.3 billion in assets, 50,000 members. So we went from having 32 staff to 160 staff. We went from having 12 branches to 26 branches, enabling us to put more and more back into those communities and industries we serve. So vital for us that every decision we make today reflects upon the ideals and the aspirations of those that started this bank. Um, all those years ago. So using that legacy and that heritage that we've got is really important so that we have an eye to you know, the people that have gone before us, but we also can carry that forward, making sure that we have a really strong, thriving business into the future. Never thought I'd see the day where it has grown to where it is today. But to grow as far as it's grown now, it's, it's, I find it's amazing. I was there from day one, 50 years ago, at the meeting at the Town Hall, and I'd just like to congratulate all those that formed the credit union in those days to make it what it is today. Well, there you go. That's our history, a very proud history. From the Waterside Workers' Federation through to Unity Bank, the task for us going ahead is ensuring that the thousands of members of this organisation continue to have a banking service that is there for them and their families. So we need to make sure that the bank is strong, functional, working, and it will remain your bank, our bank, Unity Bank.